Hi, I'm Nadia Jiximbaeva. I'm Chief Reinvention Officer at We Exist Reinvention Agency. And today on the show, we'll talk about why reinvention should become your strategic priority, how often you should reinvent to survive in business, and most importantly, what in the world is Titanic Syndrome? Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we're going to be taking an insider look at reinvention. Is it something used as a spin for companies with a bad PR? Or could it be actually be a path to innovation, sustainability, and dealing with disruption? Remember, you can uh, now chat about this episode or any episode of our shows on our Facebook community. Simply go onto Facebook and look for Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast, and there you'll be able to chat about this show or any of the past episodes. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can now find the show on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, and a whole bunch of great places anywhere you listen to your podcasts. We also need your help in staying relevant, so please go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. You can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from, I don't know, Philadelphia to Wisconsin to Colorado and Florida. We're everywhere. Also, look for us on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 subscribers, and if you're a regular listener, big thank you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can also catch us on Google Home and Alexa by simply saying, play Dove Baron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, sales leader, entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, you know that the world is changing. And as leaders, we must stay ahead of the curve. But the thing about that means we must stay ahead of the curve, particularly when we're already huge. But how? Well, stay tuned because I have a special guest for you today. Somebody I met many months ago is taking a heck of a time to get her on the show because, well, she's a superstar. Let's just face it. Dr. Nadia Chekt and Baiva. Maybe that's her name. She will say it correctly for us later. I've made a balls of it several times before we even started recording. <laughs> she's a scientist. She's an entrepreneur. She's the author and chief reinvention officer at We Exist Reinvention Agency. She advises to Fortune 500 and private companies. Nadia helps such companies as Coca-Cola, IBM, Cisco, L'Oreal, Daniel, Cola, Esther Bank and uh, the Vienna Insurance Group, just so many. She helps them reinvent their products, their leadership practices, and the business models to meet the new market demands and prepare for incoming disruptions. As a speaker, she's delivered keynotes to more than 100,000 executives. As a business educator, she runs hundreds of executive uh, education workshops for nearly 10,000 leaders. She's an award-winning author, TEDx speaker, and her new book is The Titanic Syndrome, Why Companies Sink and How to Reinvent Your Way Out of Any Business Disaster. It's a completely different book. As she says, it's a living book. We're going to get into that in a bit. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Dr. Nadia <laughs> Woo! Oh my goodness, 
excellent with my last name. God bless you. This is excellent. So, 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 so everybody knows how to say your last name. Please tell us. Jeksembaeva. 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 Yep. It's a very hey. Kazakh name, and I'm from Kazakhstan, and I, I feel connected to my country, so I felt compelled to keep it. Well, I think that's great. And I was going to say, let's talk exactly for that. Let's start off right there with the Borat connection, which is Kazakhstan, right? Was that insulting to you or did you like him? Oh, I haven't even dared to watch the movie. When I saw the previews, <laughs> I felt so hurt. And, you know, when you come from a relatively small country by population, we are ninth largest in the world by territory, but it's very small population. So sure. I feel very protective of my home. I'm sure. And very often people ask me why my company is called We Exist. And uh, very few people know it's recently been featured in Wall Street Journal magazine that in about 100 years ago, 40% of the population of my country was killed in right. an artificially designed famine. So for me, the fact that we survived, that we're still here, is very important. And that's why Borat was definitely insulting Really? And that was 40 years ago? That was about 100 years ago. So the wow. first famine started in 1919. Uh, it was a mechanism for the government to control population. And then the second more massive famine, where about 2 million people got killed, which is about 38%, uh, was uh, 1932 and 1933. Wow. Yeah. You know, I'm... I, you know, I'm a student of history and, uh, and, and certainly of politics, and I'm I mean, it's fascinating to me, you know, when you think about the Armenians who went through a genocide, you know, uh, this is a genocide that you're describing, you know, and it's, you know, we, and by the way, meaning no disrespect to what happened to Jews in Germany or in Europe, um, you know, that was a genocide, but it's not the only one. And I think that we forget that, you know, it's, you know, it's, very easy to see the genocides and the mass murders that have gone on. I mean, leadership has been in need of reinvention for a very long time. Um, and sadly, you know, you know, I wasn't looking at going starting there, but sadly, um, we seem to be in a time where that is on the rise again, that, that authoritarianism was pretty, we're Absolutely. in very interesting times, polarized times, because I think that on the other side of it is a growing uh, awareness and wanting to make sh the shifts and changes. So it's it's fascinating time. So I actually really like, uh, thank you for telling us the reason why you named your, com uh, your company We Exist. Mm -hmm. That's actually spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm with you completely. I think for most of the history of humankind, we used fear as the main method of leadership. Whether you like it or not, some of the biggest leaders, the ones we admire and the ones we hate, uh, universally used fear. And we came to the time where it's no longer okay. Uh, partially because the speed of change is so high that fear is counterproductive. It used to be because we didn't change for very long periods of time. We were exact same, doing exact same thing. Then control is a great mechanism in the time of stability. At the time of very fast moving change, empowerment works better. Well, it's interesting because I would agree with you, but I'm also a student of politics and, and, mm -hmm. and I look around and I see Turkey with mm -hmm. an authoritarian leader, yeah. Hungary, authoritarian mm -hmm. leader, uh, Philippines, authoritarian mm -hmm. leader. Uh, we're seeing the rise of it in many countries, mm -hmm. you know, some would say it. In, in the US, um, there's a rise of the right wing in Germany, in the UK, and in France was very mm -hmm. close. So, and all of those mechanisms use fear as their mm -hmm. primary thing. I mean, you know, you know the, the caravan is coming or whatever the craziness is this week. So, you know, it, it's fascinating to me because I agree with you that we're in a change time where, where there's greater exposure to knowledge that we didn't have back in those days, which is wonderful. And at the same time, the psyche of human beings is to be fearful and we need to overcome that. So <clears throat> how, do you, how do you dance with that in your mind? Because you, know, you said we're, we're in a time of great change and more knowledge. And at the other side is this authoritarian fear-driven leadership. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a short-term issue and there's a long-term issue. So I'll speak mm. to both. In terms of a short-term, um, I truly believe that fear is a natural, healthy, and very important emotion, very underappreciated mm. emotion. Sure. If you think about biology, fear is there to help us focus and to help us manage our energy better. So fear sure. releases the stress hormones, mainly yep. adrenaline. Cortisol. And, and yeah, adrenaline. cortisol, adrenaline. And all of that makes sure that your extremities, meaning your hands and your feet, are pumped with blood so you can face whatever yeah. is you can fight or flight. <laughs> fight or flight, yeah. So it has a very important function. This is unfortunately bad news for any leader who is trying to ignite change in their company because biologically, in the short run, we don't have a repertoire in our body that says, yay, change is here. As you just mentioned, fight or flight, both of those are very negative. Fight or flight, either mm-hmm. you kill the change or you run away from change. None of those two options says, finally, I'm so excited you're introducing this transformation program. I've been waiting for it. <laughs> finally, it's not an option, right? Biologically, it's not right. an option. So that's bad news for us as leaders. But we have good news. Um, for most human beings, biologists calculated how long it takes for the cortisol and adrenaline, all of those beautiful stress hormones, to hit your blood and come out through the kidneys. And for the average human being, that's only 90 seconds. So you don't have an option for only 90 seconds. After 90 seconds, you do have a choice. The mm. problem is that our head can start the cycle again. Again, So we yeah. can start the new 90 seconds and the new 90 seconds. I know companies who've been in those 90 seconds for the last nine years since the crisis. Sure. I know countries who've been in this 90 seconds for the last 900 years. They're still upset about something that happened 900 years ago. Yep, absolutely. So how we deal with that? First of all, don't fight fear. Let mm-hmm. it build up as an energy and then use it as a resource. So if you come to a meeting and you're introducing a major transformation, maybe it's a restructuring, maybe it's a new budgetary standards, Maybe it's entering new markets. Maybe it's closing a subsidiary or a product line. And you know there will be fear in the room. First of all, prepare for it and let people vent. Give them their 90 seconds. I have a teenager and we have this conversation very often at home. She's uh, going through the normal 15-year-old challenges. And just a couple of days ago, we were having some heated discussion. And she said, mom, give me my 90 seconds. Did she? So, oh, that's yeah, fabulous. She completely did. So fabulous. it reminds me that we need to give our employees their chance for their 90 seconds. This is, a, this is a central rule also in healing. So if you go to a cancer patient, they tell you, give yourself 15 minutes a day to be extremely angry about your cancer and then move on. So number yeah. one, don't fight it. Let mm-hmm. your employees vent, feel their pain. Don't try to squash it. And then use it as a resource because it's a powerful, your body spends so much energy to build it up. Why mm-hmm. waste it? Why put it, you know, to, uh, to drain, put it to, to a good use. So that's a short term. In the long run, uh, we are wired for dealing with change. Uh, I remember recently um, Stanford professor Carol Dweck, she asked this question that I just love. She said, have you ever met an unmotivated baby? <laughs> yeah. uh, most babies are wired for change, right? They're motivated right. from birth, unless we're dealing with a, a health issue. Babies sure. are motivated from birth. None of them mm-hmm. are sitting there like, I don't want to know that I have hands or I'm not interested in walking or I'm just, I'm not going to move to solids. Not going to happen. Not my interest. Like, babies are naturally moving with the flow. The problem is we educate them out of it. Absolutely. So, all those historical figures and um, the political situation you mentioned today, whether we're talking about Brexit, whether we're talking about the elections in the U.S. I live in Ohio now, right in the middle of really rural Ohio. Whether we're talking about European or Brazil, the recent election. Yeah, Brazil, of course, right. Yeah. The huge, huge election in Brazil. I truly believe this is a war between two types of people. The people who learned or preserved their ability to change and Mm -hmm. people who were educated out of their natural ability to change and reinvent. And because they feel so out of their ability to deal with the wings of change, 
they feel anger and frustration and fear. I had a conversation here with an 18 year old right after the vote in 2016, and it was here in the rural part of Ohio. And I asked him, why did he vote for Trump? And mm -hmm. he said, it will not be better for me, but at least I can send a wrecking ball into your life. And wow. it was such a painful answer. Mm -hmm. Because the essence of what he said is, I'm 18 and I have absolutely no hope. So the mm. only answer I have, the only answer I have is to kick out um, and create a, um, a kind of throw away uh, and destroy something in your situation, in your life. That is so very sad, huh? Mm. So I, I truly think this is an existential issue. We need yeah. to preserve the kids' ability to reinvent. And for those adults who already lost some of their ability or educated out of it, we need to recover that ability and bring it back to them. Their natural innate skill to flow with the change. Wow. That's very insightful. Thank you. Uh, really insightful. I mean, you know, because I, one of the things that we've got to really grasp is, and particularly in the context of what you said about the 90 seconds, is that if in a dictatorial situation, um, you have to realize that that leader is reigniting that 90 seconds constantly. And when, you know, with a Twitter feed or whatever it might be, and just keeping that, you know, years, uh, like uh, in 2017, I wrote a piece and I said, what is the number one skill of, I asked, people, what is the number one skill of Donald Trump? And, and people said, you know, all these different answers. And I said, no, the number one skill of Donald Trump is the ability to steal the mic. Doesn't matter Absolutely. what's going on, he can take the mic and he can steal it and he can make it about him or his agenda. Uh, and, and actually, I kind of admire that in a, from, a, from a communication skill. Absolutely. Right? Um, but what you do with that communication, if you reignite fear, that's a different subject. And so what if we, what if we all took that on and said, well, let's, let's take on, I mean, because thank you, this is great for people to understand. What if we all took on, let's feel our shit, feel our fear, whatever it is for 90 seconds, move on and actually encourage other people to do that. Because as I've said for years, and we do it in our work is, we talk about the, the importance of venting, but mm -hmm. not taking on. The importance mm -hmm. of vomiting the, the venom out, but mm -hmm. not vomiting it on somebody else. And this is vitally important. So this, is, this was an unexpected and very grateful thank you for, for sharing this. My pleasure. Now, we've talked about, you know, we started here talking about reinvention. We talked about all that. But this is something you, you personally confronted head on. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you said you were born in, in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, there was, you know, that was part of the Soviet Union. Um, I am old enough to remember the wall coming down. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, I remember the Gorbachev Reagan conversations. Mm -hmm. I even remember the lead up before that. I remember the stuff going on in Poland with Let's Lensa and all that amazing for me. It was a fascinating time in history. But you, for you, it was a very different thing. For me, I was the observer of this massive change and it was all whoa great you know uh, russia's fallen uh, you know and now you know the not russia but the the, the uh ussr has fallen and now we're gonna have open borders and blah, blah blah but it was a different experience for you all together living inside part of the soviet union right oh absolutely so as i often say for me my fascination with change my relationship with change started long before i, bo I was born i mentioned already the famine that was designed in our country as a result of that, my great-grandfather was executed because he protested. My grandfather was raised an, in an orphanage house as a son of the enemy of the state. He was committed to prison many times, tortured, killed himself when my dad was a teenager. My wow. life is defined by the story, even though we never spoke about it. We only speak about it now when it's safe to speak about it. But mm -hmm. my parents raised me prepared for any kind of disruption. I'm and sure. when the Soviet Union collapsed, and you, you remember that Soviet Union did not collapse the way European countries make their changes like. No, uh, of course there not. Is a, there is a referendum and there's a long discussion and there is some sort of debate. That didn't happen. What happened is three individuals 
in the presence of three out of 15 republics. So imagine that three states of the Soviet Union or three states of US or three, um, you're in Canada, so three areas in Canada, I don't know how you call it. Provinces. Pro three provinces or two provinces in Canada got together over a drink and signed the, the dissolution of the country. That's what happened to us. Nobody had a warning. Nobody had an idea. And my country, Kazakhstan, we were so unprepared that it took us another two years to introduce our currency because we had simply no expertise. We lived wow. on a borrowed currency, currency for two years. I remember very clearly traveling in that time on Russian rubles because we had no Kazakh anything. So for us, I think on one end, I felt very prepared and very excited, but I also watched absolute majority of people around me feeling uh, complete despair. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a huge spike in suicide rates. We had uh, tremendous violence on the streets. We had every kind of thing you don't want to see when your uh, children are growing up. And I was sure. a teenager at the time. I, I used it as a great opportunity. So I went to work. I started working first in an insurance company. I felt like my career started. I got a scholarship to study in the U.S. My life was great. But that is only because my parents gave me skills. So the question for me, what I am really working on for the last 20 years is how do we scale those skills? So I just got lucky. But how can we make it systemic? So it's not just a matter of luck. It's a matter of absolute sure system that every child and every adult is given reinvention is their basic literacy skill. Because if you look about 100 years ago, right, majority of population could not read, could not write, and could not count. Those became the basic literacy skills and they changed the century. Yes. If this century, if we were to name our personal choices of what should be the basic literacy skills of this century, I would definitely add reinvention to that list. That's fascinating. So, okay, so, so let's go into that. Mm -hmm. Because you're not talking about reinvention in the way that we normally think about it. I mean, we think, you know, often we think about it oftentimes as a, a brand shift. Mm -hmm. You're talking about something very different. I'm talking about the ability to renew in whichever way you need to renew, depending on the situation. So when we work with companies, our agency has faced everything from our president killed himself for some reason I keep mentioning suicides today it's clearly on my mind too um, we have an opportunity to enter a new market so it's a positive story we have an opportunity to enter a new market we just don't know how to go about it we face things like we need to downsize and things like we need to expand we talked about every kind of format so it is about an essential skill to renew which means two difficult questions Mm -hmm. What do we need to change? What right. do we need to let go, right? So what do we need to release? Yes. A much more difficult question is what do we need to keep? When mm. we talk about change management, when we love change management, the last 30 years, that's been a rise of change management. The hardest issue of change management is not change, it's continuity. And that mm -hmm. is the essence of reinvention. Why I am, for example, not speaking about innovation, which is dear to my heart. But mm -hmm. innovation, we all studied the law of diffusion of innovation. It's a 50, 60, 60, 70 years old law. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear and it's been studied to death. The statistic remained about 2.5% of the world are innovators. That's it. 2.5%. Right. Right. That right. means in a typical meeting, we might have one person who is a natural innovator. And that person will be excited every time you give them a challenge. But most people get very fearful of the challenge sure. of something new. Reinvention yeah. reframes that problem. So it's very hard for me to imagine a drastically new way to transport goods, a magnitude new way of uh, delivering sound or food or anything else. But I can imagine one way to renew, to improve, to upgrade, to do something better. One little mm -hmm. upgrade, every one of us has an opinion about that. So mm -hmm. it is about a constant and constant renewal. The way I define reinvention, and we wrote this definition as a community, we have a practicing community of both consultants and 
um, in company practitioners, and this is our definition. Reinvention is a practice of embracing change by reimagining and remaking something so that it manifests significantly new and improved attributes, qualities, and results. So essentially, the essence of reinvention for us is ability to embrace change. And the right. way you do that is by reimagining and renewing, letting go of something and keeping something that is crucial. And as you said, the, the challenge is which is which? <laughs> That's right? the hardest. That's, That's the, the hardest. Hard. And because by our very nature as human beings, we want to hang on to things. We want to keep things. Like, so we don't only want to keep things the same. We don't want to give anything out. If you don't believe me, go outside, look down the street, and there's probably a storage company down the road, uh, which didn't exist in the 1960s. And now there's millions of acres of storage space in the United States alone that didn't exist 50 years ago. That's Absolutely. how bad we want to hold on to shit that we don't. You know, it's like, we don't hey, need I've it. got a storage space too. I know, right? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I absolutely. I'm with you. This is a counterintuitive, and there are a few things that make it even harder. So there's excellent studies done. Uh, one article was recently in Harvard Business Review on, on the fact that if you don't reinvent on time, the chances of you to ever come back to the top of performance, to the peak performance, about 10%, but what is on time? It's reinventing when it's on a decline. Meaning that if, if you are reaching the peak, you are in a good shape. But if you start reinventing on a decline, whether it's decline of sales, decline of customer satisfaction, decline of um, your profit margin, whatever measure of success you wanna use, decline of happiness, if you talk about your personal sure. success. If you reinvent on a decline, the chances of you being successful are only about 10%. That is a staggering number. So I want to stop there for a minute because I want yeah. people to get that because reinvention uh, is something that most of us do as a reaction to. And what you're talking about, which I think is the profound piece that everybody has to get, is it's actually in presumption, in assumption of change will come, so reinvent before it becomes. It's very interesting because yesterday I read an interview with um, Jeff Bezos uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Amazon, and, and what he said was he, he talked about something that people never expected, because we all know how successful, how powerful Amazon is as a machine, right, outside of anything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. And he talked about our failure is coming. Mm -hmm. Our only job our only job is to delay that as fast as much as we can by constantly reinventing. And and here, I mean, you're saying exactly that. Mm -hmm. And here's one of the biggest companies in the world getting it. Like, so when we think about Amazon, we think about the ultimate success, you know, Amazon, Apple, you know, you can't pretty much go wrong. Mm -hmm. But these are companies that are actually reinventing themselves. When I ask people all the time, what do you think, you know, you know how much money Bezos has got. We all hear about it, right? Yeah. You all know how, uh, how much money is being made by Amazon, right? Yeah. Of course. How do they make their money? Everybody says Amazon stores. No. Amazon web services. Absolutely. What the hell is that? Space they sell to the CIA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people are like, yeah. what? Yeah. yeah. They actually don't give a shit about your book. <laughs> it's a front for the real business mm -hmm. because, but again, from your point, they started out as a book company. And then and they reinvented and reinvented. Constantly reinvented. And I mean, for me, if you, you know, if we want a case study that backs up what you're saying, it's Amazon. They have constantly story, reinvented and they, and they continue to do so. It's, it's phenomenal, which takes us to your new book because the, the new book is called The Titanic Syndrome. Um, so tell us what is the Titanic mm -hmm. Syndrome and why should we care? I think we've, we may already have it from Jeff Bezos, but let, let's, let's go there. Well, um, Titanic Syndrome is exactly what Jeff was speaking about if you don't develop a reinvention mindset. It's an opposite of reinvention mindset. So what is Titanic Syndrome? We were, my team and I spent a long time looking for a powerful metaphor for what we see in a lot of our clients. Mm -hmm. We are 11 years old company and we've been growing very happily and we've been growing through the world of mouth. We've been a referral business 
we've been booked to capacity, we are happy. And about a few years ago, we started asking, can you give us materials? If you cannot take us as a client, can you give us your methodology so we can implement it ourselves? So we're like, hmm, what is our methodology? So we started putting together some of the things we did on our own without any books into a material. And that's how this book came about. It's a very pragmatic, it's tried and tested tools, concepts and so on. And we were looking for a central metaphor that helped us explain what do we see in companies when it goes wrong mm -hmm. and how do we turn it into right? And the central metaphor came as a surprise to us as an accident. One of my friends, a professor I teach with sometimes in Slovenia, uh, used the story of Titanic in a class. And I wanted to dig deeper. So I started researching the story. And I discovered amazing things, things you just cannot believe. And they're exactly what I see in businesses, exactly what I see our leaders are doing. So what really killed Titanic? Number one is it's very tempting to say the iceberg. When I'm in a meeting, in a business meeting, it's so tempting to say, oh, it's competitors or the freaking regulators or uh, the suppliers are screwing us or the customers that just are not appreciated or whatever. Blame someone on the outside. It's so easy to blame the iceberg. Arrogance is what arrogance. brought down. The Absolutely. Titanic. So what, how did that arrogance show up? Because arrogance is a very sneaky thing. Sometimes I think of myself, am I an arrogant person? I'm like, no, I'm not an arrogant person until I check my behavior. So what <laughs> I'll give you one example. At the time of the collapse, the person who was at the wheel, if you remember the movie, the captain was already speaking, uh, sleeping, sleeping. And at the time of a collapse, it was a first officer. His name is Murdoch. And he was a 39 year old, very experienced, very committed, very disciplined executive. If you can kill him, Ooh, call him yeah, a, of an executive. He's executive right? of the ship, yeah. Yeah, he was a very, very, very experienced, humble, professional executive. So he wouldn't come to mind when you think about arrogance, but he was known in the whole industry. He was in the newspapers, and not only for this company, but he was known in the industry for one remarkable skill. And that skill is avoiding collisions. He was done, wow. he's done this successfully many times. Before Titanic, he was steering the ship called Arabic. And it was in the newspapers how he was able to avoid a collision with another ship with only a few inches in between and really successful story. So at the time of the collision, he did exactly what his past success taught him. He had only a few seconds to give those orders and he gave all the right orders for a wrong situation. Mm. So his past success became the subtle unconscious arrogance. And in that sense, I am as faulty as anyone else. I come to a meeting and I have junior people in my team and I start saying, you know, we've done that before that won't work. I, 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 I think I'm speaking from experience, but it's exactly my past success that can kill me. Another story, for example, in terms of the subtlety of arrogance of Titanic, um, they had extreme commitment to customer service, true, meaningful commitment. And of course, they had first class passengers that they wanted to please in particular. And they had this special service to the first class passengers. They had a new radio machine. And any first class passenger could relay a radio message. So they got tons of warnings that there is an ice field coming. One of them was recorded and it's uh, in the core data. So you can see that another ship was passing by and it was telling them, you have ice on your way. And the recorded response from the Titanic was, shut up, get off my frequency. I am relaying messages for first class passengers. So you can say customer service killed Titanic. So wow, it's, yeah. it's very powerful story. So when I started looking at case after case of this individual symptoms of a greater syndrome, mm -hmm. I saw that it's a very deep, um, subtle and sneaky mindset. So I call Titanic syndrome, my definition for Titanic syndrome, it's a corporate disease in which organizations facing disruption bring about their own downfall through arrogance, excessive attachment to past success, or blind a blind trust of the status quo. So these are three markers. Arrogance, that's the most obvious 
marking. A more subtle form of arrogance is excessive attachment to past success or the simple blind trust that things will always be the same, that things work and they will continue working. And today I see more and more companies developing this disease and therefore finding themselves in a huge graveyard. I mean, just this few months in the US, Toys R Us, Sears, the, the giants of business, Sears yeah. reinvented the industry with their mail yeah. order homes in the 20s and 30s dead. So I see companies developing this disease more often than ever before. Fascinating. Um, you know, it, it just rings so true and it's so important. I mean, we all know the adage, you know, if you're, if you're uh, planning your future based on your past success and the strategies of your past, that's a recipe for disaster. We know that, but I don't think, you know, it's one of those things I say that I think people know stuff but don't do stuff mm -hmm. uh, because, well, it's different for us. We're yeah. a different industry. It's different with this. It's different with that. No, it's not. You're going down. <clears throat> and, I think, and I think on top of it, you know, you and I talked about this in context of other work that you've done before. Um, you, know, you, you know, on the surface of it, uh, what brought the, the Titanic down was an iceberg. But we now know customer service was part of it. Subtle arrogance was part of it. There's a whole myriad of things that, that, that are there below the surface. Um, and that's not meant as a pun, but, you know, it's, there are so many other things below that we just don't pay attention to. And I think that we tell ourselves we're better than because we solve an initial problem. And you and I talked about this in our previous chat off air, where um, you were doing wonderful work in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I had said that I'd written a piece that I talked about second level, third level, fourth level problems. And we are, as a as business, we look at it and we go, what's the problem? It's this, we need more sales. Well, we go out and get more sales. And you know, I see this all the time now. It's very popular because of uh, Grant Cardone, the 10X your business. And, mm -hmm. and I, I've said this many times to companies. If we 10x your business tomorrow, you will go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. It will be the worst shit you've ever done because you don't have things in place to make it happen. And it might look like the greatest thing. I had a friend who got an order for 100,000 copies of his book from uh, Costco about mm -hmm. 15 years ago. It almost bankrupted him because they take it on a short-term consignment and then they ship shit back to you that didn't sell by throwing it in a box. It gets all marked up and you still got to pay not only for the shipping, but for the original books. Exactly. And it, you know, this is an example of not thinking below those levels. You did wonderful work w with Africa. You know, we talked about uh, on that call, you and I had mm -hmm. about how I'm very much in favor of electric cars. I love the mm -hmm. idea of that, but we forget that when you plug your electric car in, you plug it into an infrastructure, you plug it into a system that is ailing and failing so bad. And guess what? That system is powered by coal. So woo, great, we plugged that thing into the electric, but it's electric that came from coal. And on top of that, the battery in your car is made of cobalt, and you know this better than most people, that means that child labor, child labor. slave labor is, go mm -hmm. labor is going on in Africa to build your clean battery now i'm in favor i want that to happen but i don't want kids to be five years old going in cobalt mines and i don't want us to be burning coal to power you know so we don't think in these multiple levels and, and, and unfortunately what we're talking about with reinvention is thinking below the surface getting deeper rather than waiting for the you know it's like oh i think i'll build a boat because it looks like there's a tidal wave coming Absolutely. I'm with you completely. So the issue here is that we had time before. So one of the things we did for this book is, and we will do it every year. And that's why this is a living book, because we'll update the data every year. We are doing research on how often should your company reinvent to survive? What is the speed of change? We're all discussing speed of change, speed of change. Okay. Where's the studies that can explain to us um, practically, pragmatically what it means. So because it's accelerated beyond Moore's law now, right? Yeah, it's accelerating in a way that we don't even understand. So we started asking managers in your own industry, how often do you need to reinvent to survive? And the answers that we got for 2019, every year or less is 13.7%. 
and every two to three years is 33%. Almost half of the people we serve it, and it's over 2,000 people around the world, you need to reinvent today every zero to three years to survive. That's wow. how often. Now, in the past, we could deal with the issues slowly. And if you made a mistake, 10x in your business, you had a long period of time to fix it. The average life cycle in the 20th century was about 75 years. That meant you had a whole century to fix a problem you might have made. Today, right. you made the wrong move or you didn't understand those layers you spoke about, those deeper structural interrelated issues you have no time to fix it. So then you can no longer be reactive. That important clarification you made when we spoke about how you need to reinvent on the uphill, not on the decline, it's the crucial clarification. We do not have ability to treat reinvention as an ad hoc project. It's no longer a project. It's a continuous process. And that means you need to build it preventively. You need to create systems, not just soft things. I am all in favor of soft skills. I love issues of culture. I'm all with you. This is also very hard things like budgeting process. If you have a budgeting process that allows you to decide, make all the major decisions once a year, you're screwed. You just mm -hmm. you can no longer live in the world where you make important budgeting decisions once a year. And then you just live in with it like it's a Bible and you cannot change it. We see companies and we help companies create financial systems that are reinventive, production systems that are reinventing, investment processes that create and embed reinvention into the decision making. So you have that ebb and flow, that agility built into your daily life. And it's very much a hard issue as it is a soft cultural issue. Our systems are designed for long cycles but we no longer have the luxury of long cycles. I mean, this is profound and this is vitally important. So let's just jump in with, you know, as we move into the last quarter of the show. All right. We get that you can't re you can't reinvent on reaction. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, I know for sure that 90% of, and, and, and I think I'm being optimistic to say 10%, but 90% of people are going to go, yeah, that's great, and do nothing, right? Uh, um, and maybe 10%, like I said, optimistically, will do something. But, you know, we all know um, radical change doesn't happen until there's a disaster. Radical mm -hmm. change doesn't happen. I mean, nobody goes, you know, I'm having a great time on the beach. I think I should change everything. Right? People go, I'm having a great time on the beach. I wish I could stay here forever. So, you know, whether that's metaphorically or literally. So how do we get people to grasp mm -hmm. that you have to, in the upside, because right now, uh, as we record this, we're in a boom market. Mm -hmm. If you've got any brains, you're pretty clear that it's more than 10 years. We are da due for it's a big coming. downturn. It's coming. And it, and by all accounts, by all the great predictions of people who actually know what the hell they're talking about, it's a pretty good chance it will be bigger than the last downturn. Mm -hmm. And the global markets, because of the authoritarianism, mm -hmm. because of moving away from this is all the, all that stuff that's happening you see in authoritarian is actually is actually fear based around the fact that mm -hmm. this global economy is going to collapse and people are going to start hunkering down. And although we can see that. I mean, to myself, I can see it very clearly. I'm not doing that much about it, right? Because none of us are. So how do we get people to actually take some initiative here and go, hey, you know, my business could go from here to the toilet in a flash mm -hmm. without it being real. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because we don't grasp this stuff till it's real. Absolutely. So can I say that we have a humongous success with developing a huge number of people who are um, early on? No, but we've been very good at helping this at the organizational level. So you can create processes that will allow you to, if not prevent the fall, then prevent the very hard landing. So soften your landing. The crucial skill here, the crucial system you need to build, whether we're talking about your personal life or uh, organizational life is anticipating change. It's foresight. 
And amazingly, foresight is something that gives you both inspiration and motivation for change. And here, simple routine. So in your personal life, what does foresight mean? Once a week, reading something you don't normally read. Asking at a dinner conversation with your friends, not some you know, questions about the latest show you're watching, which also is a very interesting predictor of success or trends, but you mm-hmm. can ask them, um, you know, what's the biggest trend that you are paying attention to? Or what's the biggest news of the last half a year that uh, was, you know, really shook you up? Uh, or what, is, what do you think will happen? Have a conversation about the future that will develop your natural capacity to notice and spot the trends. And if you want to be more pragmatic about it, there are great free resources. For example, trendwatching.com is a foresight organization that specifically focuses on consumer trends. So it's not all trends, but consumer is the kind of end of the value chain other than waste after the consumer is waste. So Mm -hmm. we don't have enough good resources on seeing what we're throwing away. But before that, there's consumer. Consumer foresight will tell you quite clearly where things are going and they deliver this in a very funky way it's free resource you can sign up for their newsletter and you can see for the year and for the months what are they measuring as the most important trend but doing things like uh, asking people you don't normally ask in your business life what we do for example we routinely bring people from different industries or different professions to our most complicated business meetings so i would bring a biologist a physicist a doctor to a business meeting because they ask those so-called in quotation marks stupid questions and they yeah. give you insights you don't normally pay attention to but having the anticipating of change skill and method built into your daily life will also give you a boost because you will notice something and say oh maybe i should prepare this or maybe i sh-. you're not cocooned in the past the right. problem that we are all wrapped in our information flow and um facebook Twitter, Instagram, that's a personalized feed. Facebook decides what you see. You don't see a trend. You see what Facebook wants you to see. So it's not a valid measure of what's going on in the world. Creating a measure for yourself, triangulating your source of information so you get them from different places, that's the way to go. If you remember in the last crisis, the the amazing movie, um, uh, what was the name of the movie where Brad Pitt and a few others played about the guys who survived the financial crisis? The only mm-hmm. three companies that foresee it yeah. will remember the movie. Uh, yeah. The Big Short. The Big Short. Big Short, yes. Uh, you will notice that the guys realized that crisis is coming many years in advance because they went and talked to people buying houses. You can talk to people in grocery stores. You can ask people what's going on and what's happening and how they see the future. That is the strongest pull. Mm -hmm. All others is all about creating crisis in your own life. So um, that methodology is good for some people. I am very good at creating crisis in my own life. So if (laughs) I have a teenager, of course you are. (laughs) So I I moved three continents uh, in my life. I, every few years I decide, okay, it's time to move the continent. So it creates crisis. It creates a need to let go. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that I need it in my life. I need to create pressure. If you're that kind of person, if that is a natural flow for you, uh, then use that. Anything goes. But anticipating change of the three different tools or competences of reinvention, anticipating change, designing change, and implementing change. Anticipating is the best one that gives you continuous motivation. That's, that's, that's powerful. Great. I mean, really fabulous insights. And I, you know, I, I think it's so important for people to grasp, but I did a video a couple of years ago where I talked about it. I get, I said, uh, I gave a, a tool for people to learn to how to solve problems at a, at a higher level. And I said, one of the ways you can do that, um, I learned from Richard Branson's company, which is called Virgin. And people, when, when Branson first started out, everybody knows he's a great guy and he's a great leader and all the rest of it. But when he first started in business, people thought he was an asshole. And the reason they thought he was an asshole is because he would fire everybody of a company he took over. And people said, you know, what, a, what an asshole, let us out of a job. No, no, he didn't want your bias. He didn't want your bias. That's why it's called virgin. 
He wanted to look at the, air, uh, the airline business with virgin eyes. He wanted to look at the record business with virgin eyes. He wanted to look at all those different things with virgin eyes. And when you talk about bringing biologists and physicists mm -hmm. and those kinds of people, and that's what I'm saying to people all the time, is like, if you're stuck, go ask somebody who is not part of your industry because they don't have your bias. You need virgin eyes. And the reason I'm good inside of a company is, is they'll, they'll say, well, what do you know about the pipeline business? And I will go, not a damn thing. And that's the greatest advantage. And I'm not learning anything. And they go, Absolutely. why? And I go, because I don't want the bias. Mm -hmm. I'll learn about the thing, but not the opinions because all that's bias. And how do I know? Because I got a ton of bias in my own business, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. That's why, that's how you and I met through Mark Levy, who has this yeah. ability to step us outside of our own bias. I mean, this is the thing. So this is great, great insight. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Now, just as we sort of winding up the end of the show here, um, what's something that most people wouldn't know about you? you you're, you're gaining a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of publicity, a lot of people are seeing you. What's something that people don't know about you? I was a professional dancer for, really? um, let's see, three, three to 12. Out of nine years I danced, I was professional dancing for six years. Wow. So I think that in a way defines on one end discipline, on another end, the lack that I have, I've never learned how to swim. I don't know how to ride a bicycle because my whole childhood was dancing, 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 work. <laughs> so, yeah. I, Traditional I, I, dancing? Yes. Um, I dance Kazakh national in a, a president troop, uh, but you have to have a ballet training um, to be able to do a national dance. That's very cool. That is very cool. Um, That's a good question. I, but Thank now you. everyone will know. <laughs> sure. What's something that, that most people would think comes very easy to you, but in fact is still something you work on, something you have to do that, hmm. you know, because I think that a lot of time when we're, when we're professionals, people look at us and they think, oh, it's easy for you. But sometimes it's not. I mean, many things. Um, public speaking to this day is terrifying. I'm a, an extreme introvert, so I get tired of meetings and all of that. And all of my work is meetings and being with yeah. people. Um, I, for a long period of time in my, in my professional life, I felt like my job is to save everyone. And it, it sounds such a noble idea that you need to, to fix to save. And in reality, I end up saving and fixing things that shouldn't have been saved. And I developed dependencies in people, exhausted myself, exhausted my team. So knowing when to save and what not to save has been the biggest in my, this era of my professional life, that has been one of the biggest, biggest issues that I'm working on. But that's the whole thing you talked about, about with reinvention. It's mm -hmm. like, what do you keep? What do you let go of? And sometimes there's no doubt about it. There's sometimes that that is relational as much as it is anything else. And it's, and it's, you know, and I always, I always say to people, it's not that I'm, you're disposing of a relationship. It's that you are evolving. And if the mm -hmm. person can evolve with you, that's wonderful. And if they can't, that's also wonderful because that's their path. And mm -hmm. it, your path and their path is different. As leaders, uh, particularly conscious leaders, and I know you're very much on that path, we're all committed to growth. And as successful as you are, what is one thing that you're still working on within yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, love forever is a challenge, right? What is the best way to deliver love? And again, the, the question is, sometimes tough is love. That's the best thing you can do is being mm -hmm. extremely tough. While others are being extremely mellow. Mm -hmm. So I think operationalizing love, that's still. <laughs> I love that, challenge. operationalizing love. Okay, that's cool. I mean, I, I, mean I, I truly believe love is an action. It's not, of I, mean, course I it can is. declare yeah. I love everyone, but if I don't act that way, I, I have problems. Absolutely. So, I think yeah. the, the act of love, the daily tons of acts of love um, in professional work. In, and if we don't bring it to professional work, I think we are failing as 
leaders, as I human clients, as yeah. communities. So operationalizing yeah. love, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the yeah. And it's one of the things that we actually do in our work with companies is actually teach them how to fall in love with their people and have their mm -hmm. people fall in love with them. And it's not romantic, mm -hmm. but it is deeply important that we need to know how to make our people feel loved. And that the, um, I'm, it's one of the pieces I'm writing right now on emotional logic. Mm -hmm. uh, how people are loved is different and it's subjective and how to deliver that and find out what it is is so vitally important. Absolutely. Really, so that's, that's a great, great piece. Um, what's a guilty pleasure for you? Ice cream. Ice cream? Uh, Any particular kind? I'm a big fan of uh, Ben & Jerry's, so <laughs> I always find that in my fridge. Ice cream is a big guilty pleasure. Um, I have a, a huge, huge luxury of being flexible. You know, when you run your own business, you do sure. a lot of things. So I, I go for walks as much as I can. Many people cannot easily do that in the middle of a day. Stuff like that. But that's ice beautiful. cream is number one on the on the list. That, that's the one top of the list. Yeah. Now the book. Uh, before we before we finish up here, the book is is a different book. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's not a traditional book. You've mm -hmm. reinvented books um, in, in that it's as you said, it's a living book. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about that before we finish up. Sure. Just I want people to really grasp yeah. the difference. So the deal is the following, and you know this because you published as well many, many times over. Traditionally, for a traditional publishing industry, it takes anywhere between two to five years to publish a book. Mm -hmm. And for most business books, if you're getting a hot of the press, the latest and the best, that book has been written at best two years ago in mm -hmm. terms of the concepts and ideas. And in most cases, it's written three to five years ago. I've published two and contributed to a few books before. This is my third one. And I know how long it took me from the concept to the proposal, to the contract, to the draft, to everything else. It was years. Mm -hmm. And then we have research that says that uh, 40, 50% of companies today to survive need to reinvent every two to three years. So by the time I get them the book, <laughs> It's too late. <laughs> We're out. So uh, oh, oh, you drowned, but I have, I have a, yeah, I have a I have a, thingy right here. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sorry. If we, yeah, if we go traditional route, and you are so spot on talking about the next big crisis, it is coming. We know it's coming. It's right on the surface, so we know it's here. By the time I'll publish traditionally. It will be over the hump for the crisis. I'm too late. So mm -hmm. I, we had debated it for a long time and we decided that um, the traditional approach is too, too old, too 20th century, and we need to create a living book. A living book means that you buy it once from us. Um, I think we're pricing it at, I don't know, $19. You buy it once for us and we send you a new version about every quarter. And every quarter we have new cases. We have reports from the field because this is written together with a large community of practitioners and companies. So we go into companies, we give them a tool and they give us back a case and say, this is how this tool worked or didn't work. And we publish also crap like this didn't work. Don't do this. So right. uh, these are not you just glorious. <laughs> yeah, it's not just glorious cases. They write back to us. This was a bad tool. Can you change it? And we change the tool. So. Uh, the book is, as I said, it's a flat fee. You buy it once and you get a new version from us. It's beautifully designed. So I have an amazing design studio that does not only illustrations, but also all the exercises, the diagnostic tools that we put in, the canvases, all of that is designed very well. You just print it, use it in your meeting, show the results. You just do a print screen, show that result. It's done in a way that you can put it straight into your PowerPoint. It's yep horizontally designed so you can use it at work today. And mm -hmm. as I said, you buy it once, you get a new version every quarter. Yeah, it's, it, it was like when I looked at it, it was like, wow, it's really beautiful. And as you said, not, not your traditional book at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, I mean, I think that you could, like you said, you could print it out, you can, you can make screenshots out of it, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. But I just loved this idea that it's ever evolving. Mm -hmm. um, 
particularly in the context of what we've been talking about is that things are changing so fast that it's very easy for stuff to become outdated, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I love this. I thought it was really yeah. fabulous. Thank you. It really Thank is. you. Let's see what the customers think. <laughs> <laughs> They'll give you their feedback, I guess. So yeah. as we, as we come to the close of the show, um, I want you to give our audience members a, practical piece of guidance, something that they can go away and do certainly preferably within the next 24 hours, but certainly the next five working days, something that they can take from what it is that you've talked about that will really drive it home and make them take action aside from, of course, getting your book. <laughs> well, I think the easiest thing is to start small. I am a big believer that big things happen in small steps. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you to reinvent one thing in the next five days. Put it in a calendar, just as you're listening right now. Get out your mm -hmm. phone, open your calendar, put a deadline in your calendar, and check that deadline uh, in five days. You can do simple things. It can be the way you do bedding, and the way you eat in the morning, what you drink in the morning. Um, it can be the way you write emails, the way you organize your meetings, where you hold your meetings, what you bring to the meetings. Is it a sitting meeting or a standing meeting? A simple move to a standing meeting will change your meeting forever. So I challenge you to do one small step, nothing big. Don't worry about it. The amazing thing that the moment you feel it, you get addicted to it. It's a kind of high. So mm -hmm. I challenge you to do one thing differently. Upgrade yourself let go of something, drop that trash, um, you know, whatever is sitting in your closet that you don't wear for more than a year or two, just move one thing and you will feel a kind of high that will make reinvention addictive. And that's a great idea. Um, and just to sort of back that up, just so you understand the, the neuroscience behind that is phenomenal. So, you know, um, even brushing your teeth with your other hand mm -hmm. or just putting the other sock on that you would put on second, putting it on first, all those things change the neural pathways in your brain mm -hmm. and actually impact the neurochemistry and allow you to deal with change better. So, you know, people, but this is how I always do it. I know, just do it. I mean, like, it's, it's not going to change your life if you hold your coffee cup with the left hand, but it will change your brain. Mm -hmm. So these are all kinds of cool things that you can do. And, and I love that you just start with that simple thing, because I think that, again, change feels so big for so many people and is so often off putting because it's like, oh my God, it's too much, but it's not, it's one tiny thing at a time. Thank you so much, Nadia. It's been such an absolute joy and a pleasure. Please tell our, our, our listeners and viewers where they can find out more about you and all the wonderful resources that you offer. Thank you again. Uh, it's such an honor to be with you and follow you and also follow you on Instagram. I love your posts and sometimes oh, they you. kind of startle me in terms <laughs> of the key concept. I'm like, I need to think about this. So you can find <laughs> it you. in two places. The book itself, Titanic Syndrome, is at titanicsyndrome.com. And our umbrella of product services, free resources, we do offer tons of free resources is at chiefreinventionofficer.com. So that's our umbrella brand, chiefreinventionofficer.com. And the book, you can just use the URL, Titanic Syndrome. If you forgot anything else, just titanicsyndrome.com is all good. Fabulous. And we will definitely share those, uh, those links in the show notes. And we'll definitely make sure that you can have access to those. And like I said, this is a great book and I highly recommend that you get it. And as always, you know, I say this to you all the time, please, do not just listen to this show. Listen back to it. Take some notes on it and then decide what it is that you're going to do and take action. Information is worth the hole in the donut. Transformation takes place with action. Okay, so do something with this because this, this is an amazing show. We're so grateful to Nadia. Thank you so much for Amen. being with us. Let's I hope you'll stay with us to the end. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank and for you, dear listener, remember, you can chat about this show or any of our past episodes by going to Facebook and going into our community page there, Dov Varen Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. Remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive in that these fast growing companies often hit a point where they realize they're spending a fortune attracting, training and developing talent only to have them leave at just an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in the training and development of your talent, only have them leave before you get your ROI, 
and come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Well, because you can't outsource authenticity. Also remember to stop by the matrix, matrix matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need a triple W, just matrix like the movie dot fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197. It's free to you for being a regular listener viewer to us. Remember, like I said, you can now get us on Google Play or on Alexa by simply saying Play Dove Baron Podcast. Thank you for sharing the show with everyone you know. We need your help in staying relevant. So please go on to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Until next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you need to reinvent you and your business before a crisis. Reinvent at the top, not at the bottom. I'm Dov Varon, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.